we are <laughs> we are here perfect okay can somebody comment if you guys are watching this and just make sure this is all working we had some technical difficulties but we are here let's see okay i see there are some people viewing comment below if you see this if you hear this we are good <laughs> wow i have never felt more like a millennial enough to be confused but also I enough to figure it out i'm also <laughs> like, not, I, I mean we're in 2023 can they not make things more simple i don't i don't even know okay <laughs> um for those of you that are here and joining us i'm Susanna. i am the admin of this facebook group i am the founder of federal baby which if you don't know already is a platform designed to support moms who are breastfeeding or feeding their food reactive babies and toddlers. And I'm also a holistic nutrition consultant and do one-on-one um, -on -one consults to support moms through nutrition and feeding these little ones. So I am super excited about this. Um, I have Taylor Soderberg who's joining us. She is an MD. She has her PhD. She is the medical director of Tiny Health. And Tiny Health, I discovered last year has been a total game changer for my family. Personally, I have tested, um, everybody in my family, except for my husband, he's next, but I have done multiple tests for my little one. He's about to turn one. We're going to do another test, which I'm super intrigued about and geeking out about, um, all the things related to gut microbiome. And then also I've just seen so much information insights from doing one-on-one -on -one consults with people and seeing their results from tiny health like it's just been so fascinating so i've learned so much and i can't wait for taylor to dive in she's going to share a little bit about tiny health if you've done the testing i would love for you to comment and just share have you tested yourself your baby share in the comments and then we'll do a little q a at the end so I know she has to run. We've got about 30 minutes or so, and we'll try and fit in a QA and a at the end. Um, but we're going to have Taylor just go ahead and share a little bit about Tiny Health and get us started. Yes. Thank you so much for having me here today. We are so excited to have been working with you for, for as long as we have. Uh, you've been with us since you know the, the early days. Tiny Health is a very young company. Um, and the, but it's, it's an incredible test that has really filled a gap because prior to this, there was no testing for little ones for babies when it comes to the microbiome. And frankly, there's just not that great testing for anybody of any age. There were some companies for adults, but now tiny health has created a test, a no mess, easy to use comes right to your house microbiome testing, um, that is for the entire family. So if you want to look at the relationship between your family members, you know, you can test the entire family. I say it's for every phase, stage, age of life. Um, and so it's a, it's a great at home microbiome test. And it's just this tiny little, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to grab my box real quick. It just comes in this cute little box. Um, and this arrives at your house. And then this is how easy it is to test your microbiome. It's just a tiny little swab, no mess. And so what you can do is you take a little sample and then you send it in through the mail and you get a report on your entire microbiome, including who's in the uh, who's there, what their functions are, and um, a relationship to different conditions. And that can really help you figure out what they get to the root cause of some of these symptoms that may, maybe have not been able to be addressed or fully addressed by other routes. Um, and so it's, it's, you get your full microbiome report. And the great thing is that we use a, um, the best technology there is other companies use something called PCR little science nerdy here. We use something called shotgun metagenomics, and that is the best way to get an accurate sense of everybody who's in the microbiome and what their function is. So it's just a great test that can let you know, not only what's going on, we also provide you with actions specific to your results on how to optimize your microbiome, potential actions you can take to help maybe alleviate some symptoms that could be driven by microbiome dysbiosis. So it's really just from start to finish, like the place to go to if you are trying to figure out root cause or just get a baseline of where your health is at. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, like I said, I've done the testing. It's super easy. It already has like a prepaid label. So would you kind of describe a little bit 
what is the gut microbiome? Why does this even matter? Why does it matter so much in the first year that we even consider this as an option? Yeah. Why are we so obsessed with poop? I think is the real question here. <laughs> Which we are in our group for sure when it comes to like digestive issues, but this is on a whole other yeah. scale. Everybody here, I think, you know, is obsessed with poop, tracking it. What does it look like? And now we can tell you what's in it. So our kind of philosophy is test, don't guess. Um, we know that stool can really range in so many ways, frequency, color. And so having a microbiome test can let you know what are the microbes that are in the gut. And the reason this is so important is because 80% of our immune system comes from our microbiome. And our microbiome, interestingly enough, all these trillions of bacteria that live in your gut play a, a critical role in teaching your immune system how to behave properly and recognizing friend versus foe. Who should I be reacting to? Infections, bad things. Who should I not be reacting to? Food. And sometimes the immune system can get a little confused. And so the microbiome plays a really important role in teaching the immune system how to behave. So if it's a little off early in life or a little off, you know, later on that can contribute to symptoms or it can contribute to the microbiome, uh, to the immune system, not really being able to recognize friend versus foe or just overreacting when it shouldn't be reacting so much. So that's why the microbiome is so, so important. And, um, it's yeah. So I will stop there because I'll just go on forever if I don't stop myself. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's super interesting. So, and the research shows, I mean, from what my understanding is you can definitely change the gut microbiome as a child gets older, but there's sort of a crucial window under age one. Is that correct? When things are shifting the most, when you also want like a very small, narrow, type of bacteria in the gut that we want to see? Yeah, such a great question. So I think about it kind of how you you go to school. So as soon, you know, you go to school, you learn a ton when you're young, but you continue to learn. And so I kind of call it microbiome university. And the, the microbiome is undergoing shifts and changes really up until three to five years old. And that's when the adult microbiome starts which is silly because five-year-olds are not adults, but their microbiomes are a little bit more solidified at that point. Um, but there's still actions you can take throughout the entire life course to help improve health. But you're, you're, you're correct that the earlier on, that's the first exposure of the immune system seen. And that's where it's going to be learning a lot in that first, the first 1000 days is particularly critical. And that does also include, um, pregnancy, gestation, because how you're, you're born, the microbes you're exposed to during delivery or early in life from mom and shared close contact really make a difference. And so those first 1000 days are when the, when the immune system is rapidly learning everything it can from the microbiome. And then as it goes along and, you know, kind of graduates to older stages, kind of maybe you specialize a little bit in its knowledge, like it's going to college or it's going to grad school as it gets a little bit older. And then eventually it leaves microbiome school and it's learned what it's going to learn. Um, so it really is critical to get in there early and make sure it's learning correctly because it's a you it's kind of hard slash maybe not possible to unteach the immune system how to behave if it learned how to behave poorly. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a it's a like the earlier you can check in, the better. That being said, if your kiddo's a little bit older or, or you're an adult, there's still options that you can have to reduce the inflammation that your microbiome is contributing to your body. So early on, it's educating the immune system, but later on, it could be triggering the immune system. If you have a sensitive immune system, you do not want your microbiome triggering, triggering, triggering your immune system. So taking away that trigger by optimizing your microbiome health, even if you're past those first 1000 days is really important for also not contributing to chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. Just some of the things that I feel like we see with just certain food eliminations or whatever to help reduce inflammation and, mm -hmm. you know, help within the gut microbiome too, which can be yeah. very different depending on what's kind of the underlying root cause of that. Can you share, okay, so you talked a little bit about gestation and pregnancy. Um, for some people in our group who sort of automatically get a diagnosis of dairy protein allergy, and I know you guys are doing some research right now with free to feed, which I want you to chat about in a minute, but just chat about briefly some of the things that can contribute to not having friendly bacteria at birth. What, um, you know, like what, what may be 
something that's a red flag that would be a cause for a mom to maybe consider doing this testing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's all about like stacking the odds in your favor. We know that there are certain things that can alter the microbiome early in life if that, that exposure happens, but it's not always, you know, a hundred percent. Um, and so some of those things that can, can contribute to more dysbiosis early on is <clears throat> C-section delivery. Again, we are thankful for modern medicine and making sure the most important thing is that everybody is okay. However, we do know that C-section delivery can result in a different uh, colonization in the baby microbiome because they're not getting exposed to the microbes through vaginal delivery. Um, they tend to, you know, get more hospital associated or skin associated microbes. Um, something else is just how, how you feed again, feeding your baby and making sure that your baby is growing and happy is the most important thing. However, we do know that, um, different types of feeding contain different nutrients that can support the microbiome in different ways. So for example, formula may or may not have something called human milk oligosaccharides in it. And that is the favorite food of the beneficial bacteria that's ideally dominating a baby gut. So if you're using formula, then maybe an HMO supplement or having one that has HMOs, but again, maybe not depending on your sensitivities. Um, so it's, it's really just a combination of different things like that. Again, whatever you're doing is great and wonderful because you're a mom and you're making sure that your baby is happy and healthy, but we do know there are certain things that can like your diet, your mode of delivery, um, can certainly influence the microbiome in a way that leads to more dysbiosis. However, mom having bifidobacterium can really help colonize baby, regardless of how they're feeding, regardless of how they were born, because it, that shared close contact really does influence mom's uh, baby's microbiome as well. So optimizing mom's microbiome health can be so helpful for, and, and really the whole family, everybody who has close contact with the baby. Um, and so we know that that can be really beneficial. Um, being aware of antibiotic use when you have options not to use antibiotics versus when it is, you know, highly recommended that you do take them. So that's another thing that can influence the early life microbiome. And the good thing is that when we test, we can identify the deficiencies regardless of where it came from and provide recommendations to help optimize that microbiome. And I also want to share that we do see these dysbi dysbioses, dysbiosis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in some kids also who are vaginally delivered and exclusively breastfed, we, st sometimes the right tools just didn't get in there initially. So you're doing all these amazing, healthy things, but still, if you don't have the right tools to work with, you still might have more dysbiosis. We've also seen kids who are born by C-section formula fed and their family microbiome environment is great. And they have a really nice microbiome. So it's not a hundred percent anyway. And again, the message here is you do what you need to do to be safe, healthy, happy, and tiny health is here to figure out the impact on the microbiome and help you get that on track during those first 1000 days to help reduce the risk of these chronic health conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like it's particularly, I mean, aside from like any symptoms that people are experiencing in this group or whatever, just making the habit of testing after antibiotics is so helpful. Like I had a terrible bacterial ear infection back in January and I uh, did testing after that for myself and my baby. And it was so helpful just to be able to see like, okay, this is what my gut looks like. This is what his gut looks like. And then these are the probiotic strains that we need. These are the supplements we need to kind of get us back on track. And I was so thankful that it, what our results did not look as bad as I thought they would after that round of antibiotics. But, um, and actually mine would almost looked weirdly better, like, because I think the antibiotics also wiped out all the, like, na some nasty bacteria that was also in my gut from beforehand. So it was a little bit like of a clean slate for me, but I think a lot of times, you know, people get on antibiotics and then they don't replenish the gut and then they start to get overtaken by unfriendly bacteria. And so that's where this testing is really helpful to do. Um, and, and I think also what you brought up earlier about mom, so many times, especially in 
our community with feud reactions, there's so much of a focus on baby, baby, baby. And we forget that like, especially with breastfeeding, that it's a duo, like it's a dyad between mom and baby. And so it's really important to consider how is your gut health contributing to what is going on with baby as, as you're working through all of this. And that's why I really do encourage a lot of times to test both of you and see, because I've seen people test just baby through tiny health and they're working on baby's gut health and things are not getting quite as better as well, good as they, you know, would like it to be. And then they finally do their own testing and realize that their gut microbiome is not in a good place at all. And once they start to work on their gut, then you start to see some better things happening. Yeah. I, I love that you brought that up because it's something that we have been discussing as well, because we, we look at so many results here. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great research in the micro microbiome, but there's also a lot more left to be done. And we are able to get some insights and there's some research backing it, but we have seen that, you know, sometimes it really is mom, mom does a test and we're like, oh, like the hypothesis is that if there's systemic or whole body inflammation driven by the microbiome that can potentially pass through breast milk. So even if baby, they're like, I've done all this work, my baby's microbiome is looking really on track. Why, why are there still symptoms or why have we not, you know, sort of move, move the needle as much as we thought we would. It's really, it's a really good idea to test mom as well. Um, just, you know, for, for that reason, you're doing all this hard work and we want to make sure that you have all the right information to help figure out where do I put my research? Resources, what are the best next steps? Um, yeah. And so in sort of touching on, on that from a research out, uh, perspective, so tiny health is, you know, a, a, a really, um, research driven company. We, everything that we recommend is backed by literature. Um, and we also want to help contribute to the scientific literature because we are have the, the privilege of working with so many incredible families. And so we do have a research edition of our test. Um, you can either just do a test for your, your little one and participate in the research edition, or you can do a mom baby bundle. And um, there's a discount associated with that as well. Um, and the research edition um, qualifications are, um, that ideally, uh, we no no probiotics, no antibiotics two months prior to doing the uh, research edition test. Um, and then we'll ask a couple follow-up questions about any other changes in the last two months, just because we want to conduct really high quality research with very, you know, clear variables. So what, whatever we can determine, we're really confident in contributing to the scientific knowledge. Um, but it's a, it's a research edition on a lot of these uh, allergy sensitivity related topics like cow's milk protein allergy, uh, food sensitivities, because there's just not as much understanding and how the microbiome plays a role in those conditions. IgE medi mediated food allergies is a little bit more well understood. Um, very research topic in the pediatric baby, young, young um, children population. But we know that it's not all IgE mediated food allergies. We know there's a really broad spectrum of things that could be going on. And so Tiny Health's goal is to collect, <clears throat> excuse me, is to uh, be able to contribute to research by um, people consenting to use their data for conditions that is just not well, that link is associated, but not yet well, very like defined. Um, so you can get a research edition on tinyhealth.com. Um, and regardless of whether or not you meet the research criteria, the test is still applicable. You can still complete the test. We'll still provide you with all your, all your wonderful results. Um, so don't worry about meeting the qualifications specifically. If you're interested in contributing to the, the field of microbiome research, um, you can get the research edition and then we will um, follow up and just see if you, if you officially qualify. Yeah, and I hope that a lot of people in our group will take advantage of that because I do know that there's still a need for more people to participate in this. And so like to clarify, it's the same box, you get the same test thing, like it's it's exactly the same. You're just opting into allowing your your stats basically to be used mm -hmm. for research. Now yeah. I have um I have a link to um Penny Health on www.fedwellbaby.com. So anybody who wants to go there can, and I also have a discount code there. I have not added the research edition to that. So I will add that as well. So that if people want to go through that route, they can. Um, yeah. Do you 
funnel people? Like if they answered certain questions in the regular one, do you ever funnel them into the research or, or is it just too complicated? Um, yeah, I, I think that we've done some, oh, this is where our science team would really definitely know the answer. Um, <laughs> people can definitely opt in after they've done the other tests because it's the exact same test. It is mm -hmm. just whether or not the qualifications and, um, are, are met. And so the no probiotics, the, um, we do ask some documentation just for confirmation of diagnosis. Um, not to say that that is the thing that, you know, says for sure something is happening. I know that a lot of times it is a challenge to get conventional practitioners to listen and provide a diagnosis. Um, and so I don't want to undermine that, but we do require that there's um, documentation of a diagnosis um, so that we can, you know, again, have that uh, very strong um, data so that we can eventually publish this research. Um, so that is one of the criteria. But yeah, if you've done a tiny health test, um, you can definitely reach out and ask to be your data to be a part of the research edition. It's all de-identified. So there's no personal information, um, just the microbiome data and then survey information um, regarding the conditions and food sensitivities and a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, and this is, guys, this is a huge way to be a part of some really cutting edge research. You know, like Taylor said, we just don't have a lot of research on this. And I know many people in our groups are just sort of at a loss wondering, like, how did my baby end up with this? Like, we don't have a history of, of food allergies and everything. This is the way for us to learn more insights. So I would really encourage you to participate in this. And like I said, you get an entire, when you do the test, you get, you get a login and it gives you an entire just list of information, the breakdown of your baby's gut, whether, you know, they have bacteria that might be related to parasites or candida or certain conditions like eczema and um, food allergies, all of that. And then Taylor gives a expert insight as well, which tells you like, hey, you should consider adding this probiotic strain in and, you know, you don't need any more of this probiotic, stop taking it. All those kind of insights are really important. Can you touch on that a little bit? Because I know people always ask me about probiotics and like, what probiotic should I take? And mm -hmm. I've become very hesitant to recommend probiotics for people um, just because of the way that it can change the gut microbiome in a way that we don't necessarily want or need it to. Can you kind of explain that, what testing would be? Yeah. yeah. So I love this question. Um, probiotics is something that we tend to think of as, oh, it's one, it's, you know, probiotics are probiotics. It's all one thing. Turns out there's lots of different types of probiotics. There's multiple different strains, species, types of bacteria. And so probiotics blanket is, you know, one large category heading for lots of different types of bacteria that can be in different combinations. And you're exactly right that in general, it is really a good idea to look at the microbiome to know what it needs because micro microbiomes have, you know, ideal states. If, when you're a baby, what you want to see as you're, once you introduce solids, what's ideal. Once you're over a year old, when you do your little one's next test, you'll see all these digestive function insights starting to pop up. And so the microbiome does need to shift in certain ways. And it's an amazing process that happens naturally as we explore our worlds more, as we eat more foods, the microbiome undergoes this process of diversification. And so we do want to know, is there a deficiency that we are trying to boost up or if you've done probiotics, is it, has it colonized, has it's done its job well, and then you can stop using those or switch to a different type that doesn't necessarily colonize, but may have health benefits. So it does really depend on what is in the microbiome and then knowing when it's like important to know when to start, what to start, but also when to stop. And that is an equally important recommendation that can feel a little like at odds, you're like, no, I thought I was supposed to do something. And sometimes one of the best things you can do is to stop an action that you've taken that has already done a good job. And then you can keep, you know, you, you can, you can stop doing that and let the microbiome undergo this natural process. Um, but it's really in, you know, it's very independent on, um, or it's very dependent on the person's microbiome and what baseline we're starting at, what type of probiotics we would recommend, what specific symptoms they're having, they're ha having, there's different probiotics for that. Following antibiotics, there's different probiotics that can be helpful for, for that. And so it's really dependent on what's in the microbiome, which is why 
Tiny Health can help point in the direction of bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, S. boulardii, all these different types based on your personal results. Yeah. And I will say as another personal example, after I had the antibiotics round, like a month or so after my little one started breaking out in just rashes, like cheek rashes suddenly. And so I did another round of tiny health testing for him. And at that point in time found that he was completely lacking a certain strain that's related to resolution with eczema and also uh, in some cases, dairy protein allergy. And so he had plenty of the other types of bacteria strains that you typically would be giving in most of those you know, baby probiotics, but I very specifically gave him that strain and I have seen resolution of the rashes. So mm -hmm. that is why I really feel like this testing is so helpful because you can look and, and that's something too, you know, if you get the tiny health testing is great. It gives you all kinds of information. You get the info from Taylor and what to take. There are some people who look at that and they're like, Hey, I still need extra help. I'm here too. If anybody wants to do a one-on-one -on -one with me and, um, and dive deeper into that. And I will, I'll go through, I, I log in tiny health stuff all the time and I'll pick it out and say, Hey, let's do a probiotic with this, you know, this strain to see if that helps because you are kind of shooting in the dark with probiotics. If you, um, if you give it without really knowing and once, okay. So I would ask a specific question because so with a specific probiotic, because I see doctors recommending this one all the time. Biogaia mm -hmm. is okay. I don't feel like I see a ton of results with that one. Do you feel like that one it, as a general like probiotic strain, strain type brand? I mean, I feel like there's other brands out there when it comes to, you know, the recommendations that Tiny Health gives. And that might be one that you guys have on your list for specific people. But do you, sometimes I feel like certain probiotics are just being marketed to medical professionals as um, like, hey, we want you to recommend this to every person under the sun. And so I, I see a lot of people on that one. Um, do you have any just like specific? Yeah. So I, I have, I have some thoughts here on this. I do think, you know, high quality probiotics does not necessarily mean that everybody needs to be taking the same high quality probiotic. Um, uh, products like BioGaia have a very specific strain in it and there's research that has been done demonstrating efficacy or that it works for very specific symptoms. Um, and so because of the strong research backing for that one specific product, that is where, so I come from the world of conventional medicine. So I kind of have a little bit of the insight on like how this happens. Um, there's sort of a certain point at which it becomes uh, the research backing becomes strong enough that conventional practitioners are comfortable with recommending it. But I would also say that in my experience, having gone through my medical training fairly recently, um, this is not a topic that is very well understood. The microbiome, it is mentioned, so it's great. People are aware of it. Um, but a lot of the ins and outs, especially when it comes to probiotics, is not something that is yet formally built into many medical school curriculums. It is, it is improving. I would say, I think that, you know, the fact that doctors are recommending a probiotic at all is evidence that this, you know, change does happen and we're recognizing the importance of the microbiome. Um, but I think it, there can be a, a little bit of tunneling, tunnel visioning when we don't have a, you know, a wide range of things to recommend. Um, and so it's usually recommended when things are recommended is because there's a lot of research backing, but it still needs to be applied in the right way. And it also doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for everyone, but that is a, the strain in that particular brand is one that has been demonstrated to help relieve colic symptoms, which again, that diagnosis is a whole other <laughs> can of worms because that is, you know, an insane bar to meet in order to get <laughs> help because that's, I mean, I don't know who, who invented that, but they've clearly never been around a baby who is experiencing these symptoms because nobody's waiting for that three weeks, every, you know, three hours, it's just, it's too high of a bar. Um, but there is evidence around that. So I do think that, you know, it's the most important thing is if something works for you, even high quality products don't always work for everyone. They tend to work more often for people, but sometimes high quality probiotics don't colonize in one person's gut for some reason. Um, it doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It doesn't mean there's you know, it just, it's sometimes it just doesn't quite fit and it's good to try a different product. Um, and I think you bring up another really good point that 
marketing does play a really important role in what we're exposed to. Um, and so it's, it's, it's great to, you know, a company like Tiny Health or working with you, working with a practitioner can be really helpful because it's not, you're not just getting like cho your choices aren't being made by what company has the best marketing it's being made by you know it's it's being uh, guided by companies that have done their due diligence to know there's evidence that this works we see it working in our resamples and so tiny health does have recommendations and we we haven't looked at every probiotic on the planet but we only put things in our action plan list that is evidence driven we see evidence of it working for people um so it is helpful and we have some guides through Tiny Health too and what to look for in probiotics. Because like you said, sometimes one product just has a lot of marketing or kind of gets into the niche of certain type of practices. And while it might might be good, it might not be right for everybody. And so we try to empower um, families, empower practitioners to know what makes a high quality probiotic, what you can look for and provide our own recommendations that have met our, our bar. But I think you just bring up such a, such a good point in, you know, what, what we're exposed to versus what is the best option for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, important too, is, is just to mention about why I feel like tiny health is just such an empowering option for parents like that. I think that was one of the things that got me the most excited about it. I was like, this is something that somebody can do that doesn't have to go through their pediatrician or go see a specialist or whatever to get all of these insights about your baby's gut health, about your gut health. You can literally just order the test online, have it sent to your house and you get the results in a couple of weeks. And I think that's incredibly empowering as parents to just mm. have that type of insight and then also have an action plan too, because there's other lab testing out there that get sent off and you get the results back. You have no clue what to even do with it. So that's what I love about Tiny Health is they make it so user-friendly. It's so helpful for the average person to look at it and uh, just to really, and they're always updating and making like, I mean, it has changed. The interface has changed so much since the beginning, but it's just gotten better and better. And there's so many different insights that they add in. And even if you did the test, you know, like I did mine a year ago, it gets updated with the new insights. So you can always like log back in and see what type of new research has been done based on your results from when you did the testing a while ago. So that part is really cool too, that I really enjoy. Um, I know we're kind of getting close to running out of time. I want to answer, have a, answer you, have you answer a question here that somebody brought up. Okay. Should probiotics be stopped prior to testing? Like if you're not doing the research kit. Love that question. Yes. We recommend stopping probiotics three to five days before sampling. So that way we can get a sense of what's actually colonized or sticking around in the gut. Otherwise we risk testing, you know, probiotic that's passing through, um, because some, some that, uh, probiotics do colonize, but maybe not all of it colonizes and some of it passes through other ones. We don't anticipate it to colonize. It can still have a beneficial effect on the microbiome community. And so we don't want to, um, see something and think it's overabundant when really it's just passing through probiotic. So we recommend stopping three to five days. And then you do your sample and then you can pick the probiotic back up. If you would like, while you're waiting for your, your results, you can hold off on it and wait for the results to, you know, come up with a action plan based on the results. There's no wrong way to go about that. And, you know, while you're waiting for your results, we do recommend stopping three to five days before sampling. And that kind of goes for if you're giving any sort of supplements that you are specifically hoping have an impact on the microbiome and you're wondering if you can stop using them. Uh, that's sort of my, my, um, guide for what you should stop before testing. Cause then you can know what does the microbiome look like while I'm not using certain products. And that can give you the confidence to either, yep, we should pick them back up or looks like everything looks good. I don't have to continue using those. Um, but probiotics definitely. That's, that's super helpful. Yeah. Cause I, um, I wondered that a bit too. So just real quick before we wrap up, um, so have you gained any particular insights at this point in time that you're able to share from sort of this, this allergy research you're doing that you feel like you're seeing particular trends or anything that you feel like would be helpful for people here who have babies with these issues outside of maybe what's currently published? Mm, oh my gosh. I love this question. Uh, I don't, we, I don't have an update on the research for you guys at this okay. time. Sorry. Teasing. I know. Um, when you 
people come out? Is it just like as soon as you get enough people who opt into the test kits? Okay, guys, yeah. we need more people to do these test kits because this is we will we will gain these insights as soon as we have. Yes, yes we just do you have a number? People. Like how many more do you need to have? Is there a particular number of people that need to opt in to start officially? That is such a great question. Um, we do have a number of people that we are looking for. Um, and I don't have the data right now on exactly how far we are into that, but I know that we do need uh, a decent number more. Like we definitely need um, people like your community to opt into the research edition. Um, the more, the, the larger the sample size, the more powerful the data is. The larger mm -hmm. your um, you know, the numbers that you're looking at, the more you can pick out these very, you know, un uh, unique niche changes from, you know, one, one type of condition to the next. So um, I don't have specific numbers for you guys. That would have been a great thing to have, um, but we definitely need your help. I will say that. I know that for sure. The more we, the more information we get, the more powerful those, uh, the data we uh, generate will be. Um, so we, please, if you're interested, we recommend the research edition. It's exactly the same as the regular edition. You get all of the benefits um, and you get the benefit of contributing to science as well. Yeah. And like I said, everybody, I um, if you go to fedwellbaby.com, at the very top, it says tiny health testing that takes you to my page. There's a discount code there for uh, $20 off that you can take advantage of. And I will add in another option on the website for the allergy test kit so that if you want to go through that route, you can do that as well, which would kind of be the preferable route, I would say, unless you've had antibiotics or probiotics within two months and you don't meet those criteria but otherwise and we really should all be funneling through the other <laughs> the other yeah. version of the group you most likely meet those criteria unless like you said you've been doing probiotics so yeah and you know we we will do the legwork to figure out if you qualify or not if you're interested go ahead and get the research edition and we will take it from there um, there's another question that came through that I do want to highlight because it's a, a great question. Um, yes, yeah, so you uh, someone says they have a four year old and um, now has a newborn. Didn't know about this four years ago. Well, we didn't exist four years ago, and people, you know, this was not really a topic that anybody was discussing four years ago. So um, that's why we were so you know excited to create this company. Um, and so we do, but I do want to highlight that we can test all ages. Um, the like we said at the start, the beginning, you know, earliest days is really about immune education, teaching the immune system to behave properly. Later on, it's about not triggering the immune system, contributing to chronic inflammation. And every stage has different insights. And so for your older kid, like for a four-year-old, we can provide digestive function insights. Which fibers are you digesting well? Which which um, fibers does your microbiome not have great potential to digest? And then we can provide you with really specific food recommendations. And a, there's a lot of them. So even if you do have food sensitivities, you're cutting out certain foods, we try to provide a nice wide range. And so hopefully there's something on that list that works for everybody. And so we have that for fiber, complex sugars, um, these short chain fatty acids, which are kind of energy anti-inflammatory for the gut. And we just give you so many food recommendations. And then especially if you're working with someone like Susanna, that can really help you figure out the best combination for you, but it just takes the guesswork out of, you know, how do I eat a more plant-based diet? What foods are my highest priority? You don't have to guess anymore. And when you're with your kid who, you know, maybe has some food sensitivities, it helps you create a priority in terms of what is the category of food we really should be focusing on. And I know that food is a, can be just such a challenge when it comes to knowing what is the best option, what should I try and reintroduce? I, it, all of you moms are superheroes because this is, it's, it's hard in addition to just all the other parts of being a mom. And so I think that the tiny health test can really help provide those specific recommendations that just take the guesswork out and take a little bit of that load off of your shoulders. Um, so yes, all ages, adults, toddlers, children, babies, pregnancy, anybody can test with tiny health. Yeah. And I've tested my three-year-old for rashes and symptoms that she's had. And I tested my six-year-old after he had antibiotics just to see where his gut was at. So I've utilized it for different ages as well. And I found it to be very helpful to know what to add back in. Um, 
Uh, one quick last question. Can we fit this in about the connection of microbiome and eczema? Can you do it just a short? Yes. Okay. Okay, I, yeah, I've, never been accused, I've never been accused of brevity, especially when it comes to the microbiome, but I'll do my best. Um, so the connection with eczema in the microbiome is very strong. Um, that being said, I think about it as a puzzle. If you're a puzzler, you know, and at least I think you should do the edge pieces first. <laughs> and I think of the microbiome is like the edge pieces. It really, it's a very important part of the puzzle. It gives structure to the puzzle. It's very, very informative. I think about the microbiome as the edge pieces of the puzzle of eczema conditions like atopic march. We know eczema increases the risk of food sensitivities, allergies, increases the risk of asthma. Um, and so we know that microbiome community plays a large role in the risk of developing these conditions. Um, and so there's other factors too. You need, you know, there's some genetic factors, environmental factors, other things that make up that puzzle, but the microbiome is one that we do have actions to intervene on. We also have re recommendations around those environmental factors as well and how to, um, take actions that can help make the environment more microbiome friendly. And so the long and short of how the microbiome can contribute to eczema is again, having that really, um, that following that trajectory that the microbiome should ideally take early in life, really high bifidobacterium is ideal in babies. Babies are just cute and eat, and that's really their main jobs. And they don't need a lot of diversity in their microbiome to do that. But then it's also about that transition happening as solids start to get introduced where the bifidobacterium start to come down a bit and diversity starts to gently come up. And it's following that trajectory through the first year of life in that non-diverse into more diversity is something that we know it can uh, contribute to the risk of developing a condition like eczema if we're not on track of kind of where we should be during that first year of life. And it is a delicate balance of that diversity versus the bifidobacterium. And that's why Tiny Health tells you, depending on exactly what age you test out, what your best recommendations are. The reference ranges shift according to those changes in the first year of life. No other test has that kind of changes based on the age that you, your, your kiddo is. Um, and so that's the long and short of it is that following that nice trajectory can reduce the risk of eczema. And then I could go on about, there's you know some things that are related to potentially contributing to eczema symptoms. Again, it's all just about not, if you if your kid already has eczema, it's about looking for potential inflammatory triggers in the microbiome that could exist. So there's the risk component, there's the symptoms component, and the microbiome is connected to both of those. Yeah, that's, that's great. And my, my baby's last tiny health result did show some markers for eczema when he was flaring with those rashes. So like I said, I'm about to test him again. And I'm curious to see if maybe that's even gone away, which, you know, would, would be the ideal thing having addressed some of those issues with certain targeted strains of probiotics. So yeah. Yeah. I'm super geeked out about all of this too. I mean, I can sit and talk about this all day long. I just feel like it's such a core thing and I feel like we're missing we're missing out if we're not taking, I, my hope and dream is that this would be like a standard type of testing in every pediatric office as like what you do. Like you test your child's iron levels and you, you know, whatever you do for your monthly or yearly checkups, so that this would just be standard. Yes. That would be what should ideally be happening. And it's not. And I think we will get there at some point in the future, but you all are already ahead of the curve. Um, mm -hmm. But this is, this is preventative. This is preventative healthcare here. This is for the long haul for like life. For the long haul. Yes. So this is something that everybody should be able to get a baseline, make sure things are on track because the best time to address the you know conditions is before they start. Um, that being said, if things are already going on, we're also here to help. Um, and so if we can prevent conditions from progressing into other conditions, if we can reduce symptoms, um, or if we can stop things from happening in the first place or reduce the risk of the microbiome contributing to these things happening in the first place, um, that's, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know we ran over a little bit with our technical difficulties, but um, so great to chat with you. And if any of you have questions, Tiny Health is a great, they're super active on Instagram. If you want to reach out there on the website or whatever, if you know you have questions before buying a test, uh, ask away. They are an amazing team. And I am just 
love partnering with them because um, I just really believe in what they're doing. So, well, we love partnering with you and your amazing community. And so thank you so much for having, having me here today. And we look forward to seeing all your research edition kits and contributing to the science. And yes, please reach out any questions. We have an amazing support staff. Um, I will help answer your questions. Um, so yeah, please, please reach out uh, to Tiny Health. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.